My name is Michael O'Hara. I'm a musical theater performer and a drama and music coach at Wexford Collegiate School for the Arts in Scarborough, Ontario. There's a bit of a bounce to a step, and it's, it, it's the music that's in them all the time. If, if people are down, like us and the staff, if we're miserable with each other and having a hard day, um, nobody picks you up like Mike. I say you kiss me once, you kiss me twice. You kiss me three times, you better be my wife. I say now. He's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant entertainer, and he's also a phenomenal person. I, I love working with Mike. He's got great, um, great instincts. Uh, he's uh, quite hilarious when he gets on a roll, um, and he's always up for a show, and love it. get tired of the depressing media coverage of war-torn countries, starving children, AIDS, and even closer to home, increasingly violent crimes, child abuse, and home invasions? Do you ever wish you could escape the cares of the world for just a few moments? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to help you. Welcome, welcome to my escape extravaganza entitled Beautiful Bright Broadway. Michael O'Hare. Okay, you want to know about Michael O'Hare? What do you want to know? My first memory of Michael O'Hare was when he auditioned. And every once in a while somebody comes on for the musical theater program. Every once in a while somebody auditions and there's something special about them. He auditioned and he had a sparkly jacket on and he had rented that from Malabar's and he had a straw hat on. It's what they call a boater. It's, it's one of those hats, it's a fake straw hat, it's made out of styrofoam with the band around it so you know it's a flat top and used to be used in vaudeville. And I was obsessed with the show Gypsy at the time, right? So I auditioned with Mama Rose's final monologue, that was my monologue, and my song was Everything's Coming Up Roses. He sang Gypsy, that's what I remember about him singing Gypsy. He was a guy singing Gypsy, that's my point. A guy singing Gypsy. It was really big and it was really loud and, it was, and we were laughing all the way through it because we, we couldn't believe his maturity. And at the end of the song, he held out his hand with such ferocity that the hat went flying across the room except the part that was still in his fingers. It looked like somebody had taken a bite out of the rim of the hat. He just, he just snapped and the hat broke and went sailing across the room. The rest of the hat flies across the floor and I'm left with the one piece in my, in my hand. <laughs> and that's what I remember about Mike. And then we didn't see him again until the following September when he came to the school. I wanted to be at that time a concert performer not a rock and roll, you know, a star, but a concert performer that brought like these songs of, you know, the American Musical Theater, the Great American Songbook, all these things to the concert stage, like Eliza Vanelli, like Barry Manilow, like whatever, you know? I happened to catch like Eliza Vanelli randomly on Regis and Kathy Lee, and I remember being like, I don't know, how old was that? It must have been like 11 or 12. And I was watching her and I was like, oh man, I love the way this woman talks. I was like, this is amazing. So she was promoting this album called Live at Radio City at the time. I went out, I got the album, I got the video. And that kind of started my whole like fascination with Broadway, New York City, that kind of stuff. I myself was involved in a serious aspect of Broadway musicals. I made a video with the great dynamic musical star, Liza Minnelli. There's an ad in the paper, um, Liza Minnelli coming to Toronto, doing this music video. She sang a song to benefit AIDS research from Kiss of the Spider Woman, entitled The Day After That. And I remember standing in front of the door, knowing that she was on the other side of the door, and opening the door. I've never smiled more huge in my life than I did when I walked, and I wanted her to notice me. 
And she did. She said, oh, look at that face. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so see, there I am as a kid in Detroit, uh, Hitsville, USA, Motown, the Motown Studios, looking at an exhibition of the musicians of Motown. Now, follow me. This here, I'll take it down. I'll bring it, bring it down. This is from a night at Massey Hall when I went uh, to see the Funk Brothers. This was Motown's original house band, right? Uh, at one point in the concert, they said, well, we always said we could put a chicken in front of this band and we get a hit. So who wants to be our chicken? Well, I you know, stuck my hand right up. They said, all right, come on up here. And I sang My Girl with them. And let me tell you, we brought the house down. It was amazing. In fact, afterwards, I talked to one of the one of the old keyboardists and he looked at me and he said, shit, you sing better than half the motherfuckers we got in the band. <laughs> and you know I sang with Patti LaBelle once before too. Really? Yeah. It was it was almost like Patti and I had been singing together for years. It was it was so cool. The next day, the newspaper, I think it was the Toronto Sun, said that the high point of the show was the duet between her and I. Imagine that. <laughs> In the heart of New York City, all you have to do is follow the lights and they will lead you to some of the most entertaining showcases of musical theater around. There, there are a million and a half things going on in New York City any night, right? Like there always is. When I was there, and I don't know why, I felt so terrified of the, of the city itself that I would stay in my apartment most of the time. It's no fun. It's, living, it's a huge, lonely, you know, freaking place. <laughs> like, now you can either leave this in or, or not leave this in. But I always believed that like the universe was keeping me from like achieving uh, a certain kind of fame while there was so much substance abuse like circulating around me because they were like well what's the fucking point of giving this guy a bunch of fame when you're gonna kill himself like within two or three years you know what i mean he's gonna drink himself to death or whatever like so i like i believe in a certain way that i'm only truly starting my artistic journey now when i've cut out all that bullshit maybe the dream isn't as elaborate as it was then you know what i mean maybe reality is, is more prevalent now um it's still within reach. It's all it's all a matter of, of putting it together and seeing what the hell's gonna happen. Really, uh, it was the the reason I first started working there. I got a job as a bus boy at uh, at a restaurant. I worked there for about three weeks. I hated it. I hated every minute of it. I called up Anne Miriam. I said, "Please give me a job," and she did. The kids adore him, and he brings support and care and craft and uh, commitment to working and getting a product, whatever that is, musical show, Christmas show, theater piece, whatever. Mike is completely, completely, completely committed. It's such a fond place in my heart, like absolutely. I think it's one of the most incredible places uh, on the planet, I really do. I think it's like one of the most encouraging places for young artists to come and be completely accepted for who they are. And he's cool to go up to, you can just talk to him. Ask him Helps us with our costumes and our staging. Yeah. Help, them, help me tie my tie. Yeah. That's always good for him to do. He's a good guy, he's oh. something special. He brings all of that enthusiasm and, ability, and an ability to demonstrate and his, his voice is so loud, and, uh, and he's got an outstanding voice. He can, he can, at the drop of a hat, sing just about any song, and he's always ready to perform. At any moment, he's ready to perform for people.
<laughs> okay, stand in a circle. Okay, going down, z za z za zum. z za z za zum. z za z za zum. Okay, so see here that entrance? That entrance is so timid. No hair, but lots of hair. That was way better. Did it feel better? It felt better. better. Want to do it one more time? Okay. It was no, wait, way better. Huh? How's it going? Well, that's fine. A little crazy. Um, without Mike, it would, it would, yeah, it would lose the element. Of, of just of, of glue, having a, everything sticks together. Anne would just be nuts, yelling at everyone. Uh, we would all be on a much higher horse than we're already on. Mike kind of takes us down a peg. <laughs> in a good way, in a good way, you know? We'd all take ourselves too seriously. Things wouldn't stick as well as they, they do right now. show motivational talk and Anne Marion will do this and you know I don't think that there's a better motivational speaker for teens than Anne Marion. Go inside and give yourself a word. Something you want to give this show tonight to your parents and your friends and your own insecurity that tonight is the night that you're going to step over any fears you have ever had about being on a stage. Your gift is you do the best job you can ever do for that audience. Audience of one, audience of a million. Think of it. Tonight, when the curtain rises, he walks on stage, suddenly there's nothing else in the world but that, that voice. <laughs> Why do you put it this way? Jack, take it to prom or die? <laughs> So, that's what a typical show day is like at Wexford. Chaos, craziness, but in the end, it all comes together. What he really learned from working back here with us was a work ethic. And I think Mike had a fear for a long time of just exactly that, of getting out, getting out and putting himself on the line. And I think he was actually afraid of work for a long time. I, I, he wanted to be an entertainer. He had a misconception that if he did any other job, that he was no longer an entertainer. The way Wexford works, it's funny, you're, you're performing all the time because the way our class is set up, our class is the auditorium, right? So everybody's in the seats while the teachers or the instructors are on stage. So you're constantly getting to perform anyways, which keeps your game up all the time. I, I think Mike, Mike needs to entertain. Mike needs to entertain. So the more projects he gets, he needs to teach and he needs to entertain. And that's what he's doing right now. He's teaching, he's supporting shows that young people do, which he's phenomenal at. He, he works in our summer program, he works in our Saturday program, he, plus he works on his own personal projects. So he's got so much going, and that is the life of a Canadian artist anyway. You've got to be able to do everything, so he's in a bazillion projects, and that's how you pay the bills. Well, I know you said you love him, you honor and obey. And I'm thinking that you sure look good on your wedding day. It's so funny because you never can tell what, where your career is going to take you. Like, who would have thought that I would start making a name for myself in a community, in a very small community, three hours east of where I live and where the main artistic body of 
you know, this country is. I'm here I am making like a living and an name for myself further away. Don't anybody else try it, okay? That's my market. Stay out of there. Okay, so this was the front page of the Wellington Times, which is a uh, town within Prince Edward County, right? Where I do my shows. At this time I was doing Hank Williams, a show he never gave, which if you can see on the front page, underneath my picture it says, hey, good looking. That's me. Hopefully they're not talking about this guy here. He's kind of good looking, I guess, but I mean, I think I'm a little better. No. <laughs> And uh, it takes so many hours and so many years to break through all this network bullshit and get yourself in there. You gotta go out there. You gotta go three hours away, four hours away, and do it yourself. Start up your own community, start up your own network, you know? Well, you know, Sinatra had New York City. I have picked him. In the, in the grand scheme of things, I would probably not be viewed as successful, you know, currently. I'm not auditioning for big shows, like, I'm kind of lazy, I gotta get my fucking ass together, but, like... I'm making a living, though, you know what I mean? Like, I'm working, doing whatever shows I'm doing, they're small, they're, they're you know, low profile, but I'm making a living, and, like, that's the important thing. Um, totally. I'm living in my parents' basement. I think in Canada, like Britain, we're not a celebrity status culture like the States, so you can be the biggest name in the world, like an Ian McKellen in Britain, who's in the same cast as somebody who has no name, and they all get the same amount of money. That's the British system, that's the Canadian system. I think Canadian artists, now more so than ever, can make a living in their own country. He's, I would say, first and foremost, he's an entertainer. He's a world-class entertainer. to be doing what I love to do and be getting paid for it. I certainly hope you enjoyed my way of escaping, Broadway musicals. And as the great Ethel Merman once said, There's no business like show business like no business I know. Thank you. Like the way you look, like the way you smile, 
Waiting my turn to talk to you sure did take a while. But when our eyes finally met, you were more than my hopes could bring. Now the only thing between us is your damn wedding ring. Bacon comes from pigs, milk comes from cows. Come on, baby, let's go to town and break some wedding vows. Well, I know you said you'd love him, you'd honor and obey. And I'm thinking that you sure look good on your wedding day. But if there's a chance I could convince you to be Jezebel.